Thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, I think if we can now take some questions. If I could start off with, how many of the speakers uses fluorescein as a me method of detection all of the time? You, you mean in, 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 in all in, operations? In, no, no, no. No? But parallel you do? Yeah. Why do you do that? Um, mainly for um, one reason, of course, that um, in, mainly in spontaneous uh, CSF leaks, so you can have multiple sites that you cannot uh, perhaps identify during uh, uh, the preoperative um, uh, MR or TC. So this is one of the reasons. Then you can see if your watertight closure is uh, effective. So um, this is uh, the second, uh, um, uh, the second uh, reason why we use it. And because it's safe, we did not have any complication, any war, any, any time, and uh, that's all. We use routinely to identify multiple sites and uh, to be sure to close. Uh, okay. the well, uh, just to reassure you, you're not alone because I do the same. <laughs> there are two of us against three. <laughs> um, but Rod, could you say why yeah. you do cases without using these? So, um, if I'm pretty sure, based on imaging or patient history, where the leak is, um, I, I th most of the time I don't use a lumbar drain. And so, you've either got to do a lumbar puncture or a drain to put fluorescein in. Yeah. So, um, we haven't had complications from the fluorescein, but obviously you, you can have complications from a lumbar drain or from a lumbar puncture. Adds time to the procedure. And um, we check for watertight closure at the end of the procedure with a Valsalva. It's probably not as sensitive as fluorescein, but yeah. maybe it's an occult leak that's not otherwise relevant clinically. And so um, I actually used it earlier in my career and I've gotten away from it. And um, only in really difficult cases that I think we've talked about where maybe you're not sure where the leak is or maybe there's multiple places, maybe you station tube. That's kind of another um, wrinkle I think that we've seen sometimes a CSF rhinorrhea coming down a U station tube if, if you're difficult. Okay, very good. And yeah, then I have a question. Um, what about the situation intraoperatively in normal other uneventful um, paranasal sinus surgery? I'm not, not asking now about skull based surgery with tumors, but in, in, in serious with polyps and uh, intraoperatively you get a CSF leak which has to be closed. Are you using sodium fluorescein, fluorescein in these cases as well? No, it, in this case not, of course. <laughs> we, we did not inform the patient. We have to inform the patient, of course, preoperatively. <laughs> All right. So we have to use our <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> okay, because, so, 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 yeah. uh, so you trust yourself that you get it closed without yeah, sodium fluorescein? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are, you, are you familiar with the uh, use of... Uh, Can we have a microphone? Uh, I got the question, if I, if I repeat, may I repeat it for you? Yeah. Uh, the question is, is anybody using topical sodium fluorescein to detect a CSF leak intraoperatively, I guess? Yeah. It has been published um, in the literature, you find it. Yeah, of course, if, if, if it's... We didn't if, ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any, any more questions? Yeah. Any more questions, general? Yes. It's for uh, uh, Dr. Roth about the increased tensions, increased, uh, benign increased intracranial tensions. Actually, it's a dilemma that I haven't seen a lecture or an, a roadmap for how to proceed in cases of increased tensions. Should I uh, measure the tension first? And when I'm going to measure these tensions? When you have a leaking patient, you have always a normal tension. So you don't have that increased tension except if, it's an, if it is intermittent leaking. At that time, when it stops, you are going to have the rise tension. So let's assume that it's intermittent and it stopped for a while and, and I measure the tension and I find it high. So what's your protocol? 
Should I lower the tension first and then interfere and then put a lumbar drain? Or I should go directly and close the, 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 the leak and take the maneuvers to lower the tensions? What's your steps? So um, I treat patients for their intracranial hypertension with acetazolamide medically if I'm convinced they have elevated intracranial pressure. So if they're, they're very obese, sometimes we, we might do a lumbar puncture at the time of repair. And you mentioned that they're going to be lower, but all of those series that I talked about are done at the time of surgery when the patient's actively leaking. I agree completely that once you do a successful repair, the pressures go up even higher. But if they're elevated when they're leaking, they're going to be even more elevated after I repair them. So again, yet another reason to, to treat that patient. I, I have operated on some men or some normal BMI females where I'm not convinced that they have elevated ICPs. Maybe they have another um, etiology that's playing a role. In those patients, I fix the leak first and then um, and then I would consider doing a lumbar tap after they've repaired in the post-operative period to try to determine whether or not I should manage that. I also look at radiographic signs. Do they have an empty cella? Are there other uh, optic nerve sheath dilations? Is the, are there pitting of the skull base? And those are at least indirect indicators in my mind that they may have elevated ICPs. But if all of those are absent, um, you know, we talk to the patient that, that right now I don't have evidence for elevated ICPs. Do they want to get a lumbar tap to measure that and document it, or do they just want to kind of observe? So uh, that's at least my, my practice. So it's preferable to measure the tension after the repair immediately on the operating theater, when the patient is still in the operating theater, not after the surgery. Uh, when, when do I measure the pressure? Immediately after the repair, when the patient is in the theater. That my, in, right? in, in the theater, yeah. And, and if we do a lumbar tap or lumbar puncture, uh, usually it's at the beginning of the case. Um, I mean, the neurosurgery service comes in and does that for us. So they're typically actively leaking at that time. Thank you, sir. May I ask, just very quickly, yeah. do you see a role for bariatric surgery in obese patients? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, uh, there have been case reports of non-surgical treatment for spontaneous leaks alone, either weight loss or, or bariatric surgery, and I've heard of some folks uh, using medical therapy to treat the ICPs without surgically treating the fistula. My concern for that is that if they have an epithelialized tract, so it's not like a traumatic leak that may respond to non-surgical treatment, and even if you treat a non a traumatic leak with lumbar drain and bed rest, you still have the risk of ascending meningitis in my mind. So the surgery is relatively um, straightforward, I think. And so I, I want to prevent them from getting meningitis, not just slow down the flow, so to speak. Because if you put them on Diamox, then, then that's all you're really doing. Similarly, I think if you have bariatric surgery or weight loss, you're probably slowing down the flow. But I doubt if you have actually taken care of the epithelialized fistula tract that's been present usually for years. And I would worry about the risk of uh, ascending meningitis or pneumocephalus in those patients. In combination. Yeah, and then, and then they're obese, and then they get put on CPAP for sleep apnea, and you've <laughs> added even more pressure. Okay. Islam Herzallah from uh, Egypt. So I have a question regarding meningocele that are not leaking, and uh, there are different scenarios. If there's a meningocele that never leaked, or a meningocele that leaked CSF for a while and then stopped, and then a patient with a meningocele who developed meningitis and then stopped, and uh, whether the, diff the size of the meningocele would affect your decision or not. So, yeah. So um, we've looked at this with some of our series, and the series are small. So if someone's leaking or they've had an intracranial co uh, intracranial complication, I fix those without question. Um, someone who's never leaked and has an, an asymptomatic meningocele that's relatively small, I think you could probably go either way on that. Um, we've looked at our series. I've only ever seen one complication in my, um, in my practice. That was when a patient had a non-leaking meningocele in the sphenoid, and they had a sphenoid sinusitis immediately adjacent to it, and that's when they developed a complication. So. I'm not sure that you have to fix a non-leaking, never-leaking meningocele in a patient without any complications, but I wouldn't fault you for that. So I think that that's probably a, a nice area for discussion or debate. I'm not sure that we have great answers, quite honestly. It does lead to an interesting debate because the, the risk of meningitis is cumulative. 
So if you wait 20 years, there's a very good chance of getting meningitis in that situation. And uh, it depends how good your nerve is, but I, I prefer to control them and repair them. We've got time for one more question before lunch. Just a very, very quick one. Uh, yeah, Chem. Uh, actually, my question also goes to Dr. Schlosser. Um, <laughs> you have shown after, I mean, spontaneous leaks are really a big problem, and uh, there is really no real guidelines to how to follow the patients. Do you have, are you scanning them after the uh, repair, or how often do you do that? And as far as I understand, in your long term follow ups, there were failures? So, uh, Again, leakings. So, um, I mean, so if and, you look, and, and sorry, yeah, yeah, just to sorry. finish, yeah. you have mentioned that uh, you're you're uh, measuring the uh, pressure just before the surgery, and actually, it would be very easy to also give some fluorescein because it's also my uh, in our series, uh, at least for the lateral recess uh, spontaneous CSF leaks or meningoencephalus sales, nearly we had 35, 40% uh, a second location, the cribriform plate, that we didn't really detect it beforehand during the surgery. So through the fluorescein we have detected. So I mean, wouldn't it be, perhaps it's, it, it was the, that second one that leaked after some years, which would also explain the, the high rate. Yeah, so uh, I think a number of questions. So the first, uh, long-term management. Um, so I put the patients, most of them, on uh, diamoxacetazolamide. I, I, after they heal up post-operatively, I typically don't re-image them unless they maybe have a meningus seal that I've elected not to repair or a small defect or something that I want to follow radiographically and document if it's changed. Um, and so I, I typically just see them annually then, just to make sure that they're still on their diuretic and that they're tolerating it okay, because there are side effects with the acetazolamide. And if they're not tolerating it, then that's when we need to consider shunting or there, uh, there are other things we need to do to manage those ICPs. Um, and for the fluorescein, I mean, I obviously have used it. I showed a case with that. Um, and it can be absolutely useful in certain cases. I, I don't put lumbar drains in the majority of my patients. Unless I'm trying to figure out, do they have elevated ICPs? The vast majority of mine come in with BMIs, you know, between 35 and 50, and empty cella, and and so I, I don't need a lumbar tap to tell me that that patient needs something done. Um, but the, but it's the either the males or the thinner females that I'm not sure. That's when I would would do the lumbar tap, and and I've got no problem with the fluorescein. We've used it, and if you're going to do a lumbar drain, then certainly you can find second leaks sometimes uh, as well. And one more question, yeah. sorry, oh, no, no. I mean, just just to ask because he has he expert for that. If he has patients with body mass index of nearly 50. Uh, they will definitely also have some obstructive sleep apnea. And do you have a, po I mean, we don't see that much those patients. So after the repair, uh, what is your policy you, regarding the CPAP? Yeah, so usually I wait at least six weeks. Uh, I think that there's no good evidence out there to support it one way or another, but I usually wait at least six weeks. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, and go and enjoy lunch. Thank you again to all of the speakers. They're all excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>